Mary Slusser of Calabar, Pioneer Missionary by W.P. Livingston. Chapter 20 The Blood Covenant. It was strange, even for her, to pass from the trim, well ordered life of Britain into the midst of West African heathenism. To find waiting for her in her yard two refugees who, being charged with witchcraft, had been condemned to be sold and killed and preserved as food. To be interviewed by a slave woman who had been bought by an Okoyong chief as one of his many wives, after having been the wife of two other men, one of whom had been disposed of to the cannibal tribe, whilst her son had been carried to Calabar in bondage. Such were the conditions into which she was once more plunged. The majority of the people admired and trusted her, and gave her implicit obedience. But there were some who avoided and feared her, and sought to undermine her authority and perpetuate the old customs. Her own chiefs remained staunch, and Ma Ernie, although a heathen, continued to be her truest friend and best ally. It was to her that Mary was still mainly indebted for news of what was going on. If there was any devilry afoot, she would send a certain bottle to the mission house with a request for medicine. It was a secret warning that she was to be ready to act at a moment's notice. As a result of these many hints, she was able to prevent many a terrible crime. On one occasion, when the natives were seeking a man's death, she lay down without undressing for a month of nights, ready to set out, and the first night she took off her clothes and endeavored to obtain a good sleep, she was called. And just as she was set out for the scene, the chiefs began to think it was useless to hoodwink or browbeat the wonderful woman who seemed to know their innermost thoughts and all their hidden plans. Sometimes, when she received the hint that a palaver was beginning and that a fight was imminent, she would not be ready, and would resort to stratagem. She would seize a large sheet of paper and scribble some words, any words upon it, and add some splashes of sealing to make it look more important. This she would dispatch by a swift run to the chiefs, and by the time they had discussed the mysterious, official-looking document, which none of them could read, she would come on the scene and allay the excitement and settle the dispute. One of her favorite devices during Palavar's was to knit. She fancied that the act kept her from being nervous, as well as from showing fear. Well, the sight of the knitting going quietly and steadily on, in the midst of an uproar, helped to calm the excitement. She used to say that it was only during these long palavars that she could get some knitting done. We can well believe this when we are told by an official that on one occasion she stayed knitting and listening the whole of one day and night until the opposing powers became hungry and retired without a fight. The story of one of these knitting palavars must suffice. Shortly after she returned, she wished to settle an important dispute that had been going on for a time between two sections of the Okoyong people. Three years before, a gathering such as she summoned would have been impossible, they would have laid down medicine and fought. She trembled to go, and longed for some of the Calabar missionaries to come up and accompany her. But God gave her peace. After a sleepless night, she started with her knitting material, and reaching the clearing in the forest, passed alone to the guards of armed men. Each chief was there, dressed in all the colors of the rainbow, thanks chiefly to mission boxes each sitting under a huge umbrella of blue and red and yellow silk, with from twenty to fifty of his men forming a cordon around him, all with guns loaded and swords hanging from their sides. The sky was somber and gray, and the magnificent foliage overhead made the atmosphere cool and sweet. A chair was placed for her beside the oldest chief, in the center, with one party on the right and the other on the left. But first she moved from one group to the other, drawing laughter as she went with her jokes and by-play, and trying to lessen the tension that all experienced. Then she took her seat, started her knitting, and the business began. A word from her was sufficient to check any outburst of feeling, but she only spoke now and then in order to elicit information, or to make clear a bit of evidence. Time was nothing to these men, and accustomed to one square meal a day, they did not mind a long sitting. But Mary knew what backache and chill and hunger were, and she was often tempted to tell them to keep to the point, but it would have been of no avail. Night fell, torches were lit, the voices waxed louder, excitement spread, until Mary felt that matters were getting out of hand and brought the issue to a head. An old chief summoned, and did so with rare tact and patience and good humor. She gathered up the main points and gave her verdict, which was unanimously adopted with ringing cheers. 
A native oath had now to be taken to ratify the agreement, and the necessary materials were sent for, a razor, corn, salt, pepper, and rum. A free man from each side was called forward, and after divesting themselves of all superfluous clothing, they knelt at her feet and clasped each other's fingers. Another made an incision with the razor on the back of their hands, and when the blood had flowed a little salt, pepper, and corn were laid upon the wounds. Then, out of courtesy to Ma, they asked her to say a prayer. But she always witnessed the oath under protest, recognizing that they knew no better way, and she would not comply with their request, though she offered no objection to one of the chiefs praying. After the terrible oath formula had been repeated, the two men sucked up the blood-saturated ingredients and swallowed them, and the covenant was ratified. Relieved from the strain, the whole assemblage became suddenly smitten with the spirit of fun. The proceedings were over before midnight, and after hours of sitting, Mary began her homeward journey of four miles, tired and hungry, but happy. Chapter 21 Run, Ma, Run her letters at this time bear witness to the strenuous character of the life she led. They often begin with a description of the household events. Then a break will occur. The next entry starts with, It is many days since I had to leave off here, and then follows an account of some sudden journey and adventure. Another interruption will take place, caused by some long palaver or rescue, and the end will be a remark such as this. So you see, a life here, as at home, is just a record of small duties, which occupy the time and task the strength without much to show for it. Here are some incidents which reveal to us the nature of what she deemed her commonplace work. 1. A forest vigil. Run, Ma, run! There's something going on! was the significant message. Where? She was told and went straight off. A chief had died, and the people were administering the poison ordeal at a spot deep in the forest in order to avoid her interference. She arrived before the proceedings began, and for four days and four nights she remained there, constantly on the watch. Her clothes were never off, and only those who lived in tropic lands know what this means. All the rest she allowed herself was a short half-slumber as she lay upon some plantain fronds. The men would not leave the spot, hoping to tire her out, and at night they lit fires to keep off the wild beast of prey and slept about her. In these long hours she was often afraid, not of the armed men but of the wild creatures of the bush that came creeping up, and with somber eyes stared at her for a moment, ere they slunk away from the flames. Such courage and endurance could not be withstood. In the end, the people gave in, and life was saved. 2. Igbo She was sitting quietly in the house, thinking she was alone, when a stealthy step behind made her look round. It was a woman, followed by others, all crowding in as smoothly as tigers. Run, Ma, run, they said. The words were no sooner spoken than Ma was down the stair and out in the open square, where she found a number of men pulling about and frightening the slaves and women. She seized hold of one fellow and locked him in her yard, and the act brought quiet. The mob turned out to be Igbo from a far-off town, and come to sue for a debt due by a widow, who had already given up everything to liquidate it. She knew the people, had been kind to them, and had induced them to trade with Calabar. She at once ordered them out of the place, and made them restore the property they had seized, and in a short time the matter was settled. Number three, robbers. One day she was busy standing on the box, plastering a wall when the warning cry came, Run, Ma, run! The villagers had gone off with their arms, and were fighting a band of plunderers, who had stolen two slave girls and two slave men from Ma Emi's farm. Washing the mud off her hands and face, she ran to the scene, and all next day, Sunday, she was sitting in the midst of a drinking mob, trying to keep down their passions, and succeeded at last in finding a solution. 4. Twins. Again the cry, Run, Ma, run! This time from two boys. It was the case of twins born of a Calabar mother, who had come to Okoyang after trade began. The father and his womankind were furious, and the mother lay deserted and alone. Mary took the two babies into her lap, and as they were Calabar's twins, sent word to the elder chief. The answer she received was, ahem. But the messenger added, a big lady said, why don't you take the twins to Calabar? She sent next to the younger chief, and asked him to come and confer with her at a distance. After two hours weary waiting, the reply was, I am not coming. What should I come for? Should I tell my mother what to do? Let her do what she sees fit. Well, said Mary, as one chief says, ahem, and the other gives no command, I shall take the children by a back road to my own house, and during the night the mother can follow, 
and we will see how things turn round. On being told that she had brought twins to the house, Edom groaned and said, "'Then I cannot go to my mother's house any more.' "'Are they upstairs?' "'Yes,' says the messenger, "'and they are in her own bed.' He groaned again. "'No, no, I cannot ever go any more.' Mary went to his yard to see a sick baby, whom she had nursed back from death's door, after the witch doctors had done their best with their charms and medicine. But the mother held the child tightly in her arms and said, "'Ma, you shall not touch her.' She turned away, her heart sore. On the Sunday rain fell all day, and she could not leave one of the children who was ill. But in the late evening she took two lanterns and went to the roadside, and held a short service with the few prepared to come, who huddled together in the rain. But none of them guessed how near to tears the speaker was. She felt the alienation from her people keenly. It was the greatest trial that had come to her, but she was resolved not to give in. One of the twins died and some days later Edom offered her a present of yams. But she declined the gift, as it might be mistaken for a bribe to her conscience. He remonstrated, but she remained firm, although it cost her much. Gradually, however, he and his house showed contrition, and the shadow passed away. Then a chief from another village came, also with a present of yams. Going on his knees, he held her feet and begged her not to give up the child. "'You are our mother, and a woman has proven stronger than all the men of the tribe.' We will be able to believe in all you ask us by and by, but have patience with us. When he was gone, a message came. A chief from a distance wants to see you. Come for a little. The man was from a turbulent part of Okoyang, and given to fighting and plunder. I live in my house as ever I did, was her spirited reply, and if anyone wishes to see me, I am here. She felt pretty sure of her ground, though she could not help trembling for the result. The strangers arrived and eat him with them and mats and chairs were placed for them in the court. To her surprise, she was asked for her advice, and the visitor went away, convinced that the new ways were better than the old. The elder chief, Ik Pinyong, next sent and begged for forgiveness. The mother cannot keep a strong heart against her son. Are you not the hope and strength and counselor of my life? Forgive me, for it was foolishness. I have not been taught from my youth, and have never seen a twin. Thus good came out of the trial and the bonds that bound her to the people were strengthened. What was still more remarkable than the attitude of the chiefs was the fact that the husband took the twin mother and the surviving child home. Number 5. The Poison Bean A slave woman of importance who occupied a position of trust died suddenly. When her master was told, he flew into a passion and dispatched a messenger to Mary with the rude intimation that somebody hereabouts knew how to kill people. She returned a curt reply, and he sent an apology. The next development was the appearance of some chiefs and a crowd of armed men in her yard. With them was a young man, not a favorite of hers, to whom they attributed the woman's death. She questioned him, and he asserted that he had not seen the woman for months and knew nothing of the supposed witchcraft. But he would take the poison bean, and he added vindictively, if he did not die, he would see that they paid for the outrage. She sent a message by the chiefs to the owner of the woman to dissuade him from inflicting the extreme test. There was the usual period of uproar, and on her part the usual recourse to prayer. And then back came the chiefs with the astonishing reply. I have heard. I understand that the mother is determined in her ways. What can I do but submit? Instead of death, the sequel was a feast. A goat was killed, drink procured, and dancing was indulged in all night. Next day the young man went home to his aged mother. Number 6. Runaway Slaves One day, when she was baking... A man and his wife, slaves of a chief in the neighborhood, came to the door of the mission house, and after giving compliments, squatted down with the air of people who had come to stay. "'Well, what is the matter?' she asked. She knew the woman had a child, which could not have been left at home. A long tale was told. The woman had been in the field all morning hoeing grass. As the sun rose, she and the child grew hungry, and she went home to cook some food. As she was doing so, her master, who was not a favorite either with bond or free, unexpectedly appeared, and angrily ordered her back to her work. She protested that she needed food, but, brandishing a sword, he frightened her into flight. Her husband, a palm oil worker, heard the noise, and came on the scene, stopped her, and told her to return and take the food. What does it matter, he remarked. We're his. He can kill us if he likes. We have nothing to live for. The master, enraged, seized a gun and fired at the man, but missed. Taking hold of the screaming child, he declared he would kill it, and went off. It was a simple case, but required a delicate handling. 
she sent one of the girls to the chief with the message that his slaves were in her yard, and that as they were householders and elderly people and parents, she hoped there would be an Opelivar, and that he would take them back. I will come tomorrow, was the reply. The runaway slept in the yard and held something of the nature of a reception, the other slaves coming and condoling with them as the poor do with each other all the world over. It was like a scene from Uncle Tom's cabin. One moment the company would encourage them cheerily, urging them to have patience, then came a string of doleful tales, then a gush of warm sympathy, and next a burst of laughter, followed by a shower of tears. Next day their master did not appear, and they went to work on the station grounds. The woman was fretting for her child, and Mana, one of the girls, was sent with another message, to the effect that if he could not come himself, for the woman's sake, send on the babe. The messenger brought back the news that he was on his way, but was tipsy, and breathing out dire threats against everybody. When Mary heard that three of his wives were with him, and that her own chief had joined the party, her mind was at ease. His first act was to lie down at her feet. Ma, he said, you are the owner not only of my head, but of all my house and possessions. These wretched slaves did well to come to you, and so forth. She sent for a chair, and a pal of ours several hours began. The chief sometimes lost control of himself and charged the slave with being full of sorcery and responsible for all the deaths of recent years. Shaking his fist in the man's face, he cried, If it wasn't for the reign of the white woman, I would cut you in two. The white woman is your salvation. The slave replied with passion, but Mary entreated him to be calm. She set the matter in the best light. Both had been angry and behaved as angry people usually do, saying and doing things which in their saner moods they would have avoided. Alternately scolding and beseeching, and throwing in a few jokes occasionally, she at last said both sides must go home, the master to restrain himself, and the slaves to work faithfully, and not to provoke him, as he had troubles of which they were unaware. Thus with wise words she pacified them, and when she had given them a few presents, they went off in great good humor. The slaves found that during their absence thieves had stolen their goats and fowls, but the return of the child compensated for the loss, and in their gratitude they sent Ma a gift of food. 7. Spoiled Fashions A woman was seized on the assumption that she was concerned in the death of a girl, and Mary watched night and day until the burial was over. A goat was killed and placed in the grave, along with cloth, dishes, pots, salt, a lamp, a lantern, and a tin case of cooked food. But her presence prevented anyone being murdered to bear the dead company. Ma, said a freedman reproachfully, you have spoiled our fashions. Before you came, a person took his people with him. Now one must go alone like this poor girl. You have confused Okuyang too much. Number 8. The Cost Mr. W. T. Wire, who had joined the mission staff, paid her a visit one day, and they were enjoying a cup of tea when she suddenly became alert and said, There's something wrong. They will be here in a moment. The words were hardly spoken when they heard the pit-pat of bare feet running towards the house. A number of natives appeared, and placing their hands on the floor, shouted, Ma, come, 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 she said to her guest. Come on. They reached a large compound filled with people excitedly shouting and gesturing. On one side of the yard lay a girl on a mud slab, who seemed to be ill, and opposite was her mother, in appearance a fiend incarnate. It seemed that the girl, the daughter of an old chief, had taken a fainting fit, and the mother, who had once been a refuge in Ma's yard, was blaming people for taking her life. Mr. Wire examined the girl and said there was nothing much wrong, but she was terribly excited with the noise. Mary at once said, I'll get quietness, and springing into the middle of the compound, she seemed to exert her utmost willpower, and crying in the native manner, so he water do, shoo, go out there, pointing to the door. In a moment, men, women, and children, including the staid old chief of the village and the girl's mother, struggled with each other to get out of the compound. The scene reminded Mr. Ware of nothing so much as a lot of sheep being herded through a gate by a dog. She then came to where he stood. She was trembling from head to foot, and as she sat down, she remarked, I am done for this day. The girl was taken over to the mission house, and under her care made a quick recovery. Never in all her dealings with the tribes was she molested in any way. Only once in a compound brawl in which she intervened was she struck, but the native who wielded the stick had touched her accidentally. The cry immediately went up that Ma was hurt, and both sides fell on the wretched man, and would have killed him if she had not gone to the rescue. Chapter 22 a government agent. In these years, far-reaching changes were taking place in regard to the political status and destiny of the country. 
Hitherto, the British government had exercised only a nominal influence over the coast districts. A consul was stationed at Duke Town, but he had no means of exercising authority, and the tribes higher up in the Cross River would war upon one another, block the navigation, and murder at will. In 1889, the imperial government took steps to arrange for an efficient administration, and despite difficulties incidental to the absence of a central native authority, succeeded in obtaining the sanction of the principal chiefs in the establishment of a proctorate, the Niger Coast Proctorate. In 1891, Sir Claude MacDonald, who had carried out the negotiations, was appointed Consul General. No man was better fitted to lay the foundations of British authority in so backward a territory. The period of transition from native to civilized rule brought to the surface many delicate and perplexing problems requiring tact, skill, and unwearied patience. But the task was successfully accomplished, although not without an occasional display of force. It was a special cause of thankfulness to the missionaries that Sir Claude was in full sympathy with their work, and cooperated with them in every scheme for the benefit of the people. When he was promoted to Pekin, the foreign mission board in Scotland, expressed their sense of the value of his efforts in promoting the welfare of the native population. Sir Claude appointed vice councils for the various districts, and was proposing to send someone to Okoyang. Miss Lesser knew that the people were not ready for the sudden introduction of new laws, and that there would be trouble if an outside official came in to impose them. Sir Claude took her point of view, and recognizing her unique position and influence, empowered her to do all that was necessary, and to organize and supervise a native court. He then left her very much to herself, with the result that the inevitable changes were felt least of all in Okoyang, where they were made through a woman whom the chiefs and people implicitly trusted. Her position was akin to that of a councillor agent, and she conducted all the public affairs of the tribe. She resided at the native court. Cases would be transferred to her from Duke Town, and she would travel over Okoyang to try these, taking with her the consular messenger, who carried back her decisions to headquarters for official signature. Crowds of the natives also visited her to counsel her regarding the readjustment and coordination of their customs with the new laws. And she was able to settle these matters so quietly that little was heard of her achievements. Although she rendered great service in this way, creating public opinion, establishing just laws and protecting the poor, it was a work she did not like, and she only accepted it because she thought it in line with her allegiance to Christ. Her duties brought her in contact with the officials of the country. Government men came to see her, and were not only amazed at her political influence, but charmed with her original qualities. One of these, Mr. T.D. Maxwell, for whom she had a great regard, a dear laddie she called him, writes, what sort of woman I expected to see I hardly knew, certainly not what I did. A little, frail old lady with a lace or lace-like shawl over her head and shoulders, that must, I think, have been a concession to a stranger, for I never saw the thing again. Swaying herself in a rocking chair, crooning to a baby in her arms, I remember being struck, most unreasonably, by the very strong Scottish accent. Her welcome was everything kind and cordial. I had had a long march, it was an appallingly hot day, and she insisted on complete rest before we proceeded to the business of the court. It was held just below her house. Her compound was full of litigants, witnesses, and onlookers, and it was impressive to see how deep was the respect with which she was treated by them all. She was again in her rocking chair, surrounded by several ladies and babes in waiting, nursing another infant. Suddenly she jumped up with an angry growl. Her shawl fell off. The babe was hurriedly transferred to someone qualified to hold it, and with a few words she made for the door, where a hulking, overdressed native stood. In a moment she seized him by the scruff of the neck, boxed his ears, and hustled him out of the yard, telling him quite explicitly what he might expect if he came back again without her consent. I watched him and his followers slink away, very crestfallen. And then as suddenly as it had arisen, the tornado subsided. And, lay shawl, baby and all, she was again gently swaying in her chair. The man was a local monarch of sorts, who had been impudent to her, and she had forbidden him to come near her house again until he had not only apologized, but done some prescribed penance. Under the pretext of calling on me, he had defied her orders, and that was the result. I've had a good deal of experience of Nigerian courts of various kinds, but I've never met one which better deserves to be termed a court of justice than that over which she presided. The litigants got justice sometimes perhaps like Shylock, 
much more than they deserved, and it was essential justice and hampered by legal technicalities. One decision I recall, I have often subsequently wished that I could follow it as a precedent, A sued B for a small debt. B admitted owing the money, and the court, that is Ma, ordered him to pay accordingly. But she added, A is a rascal. He treats his mother shamefully. He neglects his children. Only the other day he beat one of his wives with quite a necessary vengeance. And she was B's sister, too. His farm is a disgrace. He seldom washes. And then there was the palaver about C's goat a month ago. Oh, of course, A didn't steal it. He was not found guilty, wasn't he? All the same, the affair was never satisfactorily cleared up, and he did look unusually sleek just about then. On the other hand, B was thrifty and respectable, so before B paid the amounts due, he would give A a good, sound caning in the presence of everybody. Chapter 23 Eccentricities Spade Work and Daydreams does it seem as if we were watching the career of a woman of hard, self-reliant, and masculine character, capable of living by herself and preferring it, and unconscious of the natural weakness of her sex? In reality, Mary was a winsome soul, womanly in all her ways, tremulous with feeling and sympathy, loving love and companionship, and not unacquainted with nervousness and fear. When people saw or heard of her toiling with her hands, they were apt to imagine that she possessed a constitution of iron, never realizing that her life was one long martyrdom. She was seldom free from illness and pain. Whether her methods of life were partly responsible for this cannot be stated. In any case, she seemed able to do things that would have proved fatal to other people. She never used mosquito netting, which is considered to be indispensable for the security of health in the tropics. She never wore a hat which seems a miracle to those who knew the strength of the sun in these regions. Her hair she kept cut close, partly because it was a cleanlier fashion, and partly because it was less trouble to look after. Shoes and stockings also she never wore, though jiggers and snakes and poisonous plants were common in the bush pathways. Mr. James Lindsay, who was the engineer of the mission at the time, says, I walked many miles with her through the bush, and only once did I know her to be troubled with her feet. She had been to Duketown, attending Presbytery, and made some small concession to the conventions by wearing a pair of knitted woolen slippers. On returning to Okoyang, through the bush, small twigs and sticks penetrated the wool and pricked her feet. With an expression of disgust, she took the slippers off and threw them to the bush. That was the only time I saw her, other than barefoot. She never boiled or filtered the water she drank, two precautions which Europeans do not omit without suffering. She ate native food and was not particular when meals were served. Breakfast might be at seven one morning and at ten the next. Dinner might be an hour or two late. But this was, of course, mainly due to the constant calls upon her time, for she was often afoot most of the night, and her days were frequently taken up with long palavars. These habits, so seemingly eccentric to people, lapped in the civilized orders of things, grown natural out of the circumstances into which she had been forced, in pursuit of the task she had set herself. She had deliberately given up everything for her master, and she accepted all the consequences that the renunciation involved. What she did was for him, and as she was not her own, and had taken him at his word, and believed that he would care for her if she kept in line with his will, she went for her without fear, knowing that she might incur suffering, but willing to bear it for his sake and his cause. Her faithful devotion led her into strange situations, and these shaped the character of her outward life and habits. She shed many conventions, simply because it was necessary in order to carry out the will of Christ. She knew there were some people, like the official who saw her pushing a canoe down to the river, and preferred not to know her. But she was always sustained by the knowledge that she was acting in her master's spirit. She found in her New Testament that he ignored the opinion of the world, and she was never afraid to follow where he led. What, says Mr. Lindsay, she lost in outward respectability, she more than gained in mobility and usefulness. She kept herself untrammeled in the matter of dress that she might be ready for any emergency. In case of a sudden call in the night to some distant village, where twin children had been thrown out or a bloody quarrel was imminent, she was literally ready to leave at a moment's notice. The one thing essential to her was her work, and everything that hampered her freedom of action was dropped. Not that she was thoughtlessly reckless of her health. She frequently wrote about the need of conserving her strength, and stated that she was taking all due care. She apologized for reading her Bible in bed on Sunday mornings. It gave her a rest, she said, 
before she began her day's work. As her Sunday began at 5.30 a.m. and ended at 7 p.m., and during the greater part of that time she was walking, preaching, and teaching, she might well allow herself the indulgence. It may be noted that she sometimes misplaced a Sunday. I lost it a fortnight ago, she wrote, and kept it on a Saturday. Never mind. God would hear all the prayers and answer them all the same. On another occasion, she was discovered on a Sunday on the roof of the house executing repairs, thinking it was Monday. Mr. Ovens related that once when he went up on a Monday to do some work, he found her holding a service. She was glad to see him, but what, said she, is Duke Time coming to when its carpenter travels on the Sabbath day? Sabbath day, he echoed. It's Monday. Monday? Why, I thought it was the Sabbath. Well, we'll have to keep it as Sabbath now. Nay, nay, he replied. It's no Sabbath with me. I cannot afford two Sabbaths in a week. Ah, we must, though, she said, adding a whisper. I was whitewashing the rooms yesterday. Realizing that he must save her face, he took part in the service and started his work next morning. In one of Mr. Goldie's letters to a friend at this time, there was a delightful touch. I am at Okoyang, he wrote, and I'm not sure of the date. Her womanly sympathy and tenderness was never better exhibited than in her relations with her dark sisters about her. She entered into their lives as few had been able to do. She treated them as human beings saw the romance and tragedy in their patient lives, wept over their trials, and rejoiced in their joys. There was one little part of harem life which she liked to tell. Some slave dealers arrived at Ekenge, and among their bargains was a young and handsome girl, who Edom bought for one of his chief men. Ma Ernie, who heard of the transaction but paid no attention to it, had a respectable slave woman at one of her farms, whom she ordered to come and live in her own yard. The woman obeyed somewhat unwillingly, and in the village began to grumble to others about her enforced removal. The new slave girl was cooking her master's food when she heard the voice. As she listened, memories were stirred within her, and she ran out and gazed at the woman, and then came nearer and stared closely into her face. The woman demanded what she was looking at. The girl screamed and caught her round the neck and uttered a cry in a strange language. It was the name of the woman, who in turn stared at the girl. When the latter called out her own name, the two embraced and held each other in a grip of iron. The daughter had found a mother who had been stolen many years before. Both went into the yard and sat on the ground, discussing their experiences and receiving warm congratulations of the other women in the village. There was trouble at the time in the district, and Mary had occasion to see Maimi after midnight. She found the two sitting beside some burning logs, with Maimi on the other side all three talking over the mystery of life and its pain, parting, and sorrow. She squatted down beside them, and gradually the girl told her story, how she had prayed to the great God for someone to capture her so that she might have a chance of finding her mother when the traitors went to Calabar. She believed that among the crowds of Duke Town she would see her face, and when they left there she almost lost hope. But Ma craved the companionship of her kind, and she enjoyed going down to Duke Town to the various meetings and seeing the ladies of the mission. She would not leave the children behind, and as the whole family would descend unexpectedly on a member of the mission staff, some embarrassing situations occurred. One missionary, a bachelor, was preparing to turn in about 10 p.m., when he heard people crowding up the stairs of verandas and babbles of voices. It was Ma, and all her boys and girls and babies, come to lodge with him for a week. Fortunately, he knew his guest, and, as he surmised, they were content with the floor. When the household grew, and she could not leave the children so often, she would sometimes walk with them to Adaibo on the Calabar River, taking provisions with her, and there, halfway, would meet and picnic with the Calabar lady agents. It was about this time that the sense of her loneliness grew upon her to such an extent that she could not sleep at nights. I feel dreadfully lonely, she wrote, and want to help her, and I have made up my mind to ask the committee at next meeting for a companion. But when she went to Duke Town and realized the depleted state of the mission caused by illness and death, and the manner in which the staff was overworked, she could not find the heart to ask her request, and instead she thanked God for being able to hold on. She added her appeal to the other requests for the workers that were so constantly sent home then, and her idea of the kind of woman most suited for the Calabar field is of interest. Consecrated, affectionate women, who were not afraid of work or of filth of any kind, moral or material, women who can nurse a baby or teach a child to wash and comb as well as to read and write, women who can tactfully smooth over a roughness, and, for Christ's sake, bear a snub. 
and take any place which may be open. Women who can take everything to Jesus and there get strength to smile and persevere and pull on under any circumstances. If they can play Beethoven and paint and draw and speak French and German, so much the better, but we can want all these latter accomplishments if they have only a loving heart, willing hands, and common sense. Surely such women are not out of our reach. There are thousands of them in our churches, and our home churches have no monopoly of privilege in choosing to keep them. Spare us a few. Induce them to come forward. If there be the call from the Holy Spirit, do not let their accomplishments be a hindrance. Help them to come forward. Take them to your own homes, and let them have the benefits of all the conversation, refinement, and beauty which fill these, and so gently lead them out of their timidity, and accustom them to society that they may meet out in the world, and hand them on to us. Up in a station like mine, they want to teach the first principles of everything, and they need to help in times of trouble in the home or in the town palavar. They will not need a fine English, for there is none to admire it. No one knows other than native languages, and I would gladly hail any warm-hearted woman from any sphere if she would come to me. I cannot pretend to work at the station. The schoolwork is simply a scramble of a thing, mostly by the girls of the house. I cannot overtake it. It is because I am not doing efficiently that I am aggrieved. On her visits to Calabar, she was an object of much interest. One who knew her then says, She had the power of attracting young men, and she had great influence with them. Whether they were in mission work or trades or government men, they were sure to be attracted by her vigorous character and by the large-hearted, understanding way she would talk to them or listen to their talk of their work or other interest. She loved to stir them up to do great things. It was sometimes remarked by visitors that her surroundings had not the spick-and-span appearance which usually characterizes a Scottish mission station. She had, nevertheless, a real appreciation of order and beauty, and liked to have everything clean and tidy about her. How to accomplish this was her daily problem, and perhaps only those who have lived in tropic lands can understand the position. The difficulty there is not how to make things grow, but how to prevent them growing. She waged as fierce and incessant a war with vegetation as she did with man, but it proved too much for her strength. I think, she wrote, if I left alone some of the outdoor work, even if the place did go to bush and dirt, I would not be so tired, and I could do more otherwise. But I cannot help it. I must put my hand on what I must put my hands in wherever there is work to be done. The task had not to become easier for her, for the new trade with Calabar had brought about a demand for Okoyang yams, and people were so busy planting at their farms that she was unable to hire labor. The bush would creep up swiftly and stealthily to the edge of the dwellings and become a cover for beast of prey, and then she and her girls would sally out and cut it back and burn it and dig out the roots and in its place would be planted corn and cocos and yams and other products, the children each having a plot to tend. A private pathway to the spring, which she had constructed in order that the girls might not mix with the village women and hear their talk, had also to be kept clear. It was hard work in the hot sunshine, and she and her barons literally watered the soil with their perspiration, but no tears were shed at the work save those caused by merry jokes and laughter. She often surveyed the scene with pride, reveling in the wild beauty of form and color, the brilliancy of the flowering trees, the tender green of the yams on their supports, the starry jasmine with its keen perfume. She loved flowers and taught her scholars to bring them to school. They had never been conscious of these before, and the fact that they began to appreciate them was she considered a step forward in their educational development. Often she longed for the power to bring out thousands of the slum people from the cities at home, to enjoy the open life, and to work the rich lands. Not that she used the word slum, it seemed to reflect on the poor, many of whom she regarded as heroes and heroines of God. In her humility, she believed that many of them would have been far ahead of her if they had had the same advantages. One of her daydreams was to inherit a fortune, and to spend it all on the poor. If only. But she would check herself and say, Mary Slusser, as if God does not know what to give and how to give it, and as if he did not love and think for all these poor creatures who were so mercilessly pushed aside in the race of life. 